Right. Uh, we have we have been continuing in this story of Esther lately, and uh, I don't know about any of you, but Shanda and I are pretty big movie buffs. Um, if you go to our house, the first thing you see when you walk in the door, believe it or not, is this giant bookshelf full of DVDs, and and a lot of them are Disney movies um, that Shanda inherited from her mother when her mom moved. Um, VHS is a lot of them are our favorite movies that we've collected over time. We wait for them to be on um, discount, um, like at Black Friday sales and stuff like that. And like, oh, it's five dollars. We got to get this movie. Um, ones we wanted for our our, our uh, birthdays, movies that we like. But we're pretty big movie buffs. We like we like watching movies. Um, some of our favorites include things like Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Um, Shane and I are pretty big into the Hunger Game movies right now. I don't I, I don't know if you like. I, there, you guys are looking at me like what? What are you talking about? But uh, we are pretty big movie buffs, and I think it, most of us probably have seen a movie or two or a TV show or a book that we like. And as we think about it, we, we can think about some of our favorites, some of those books, those movies that stand out to us, that we remember, that maybe we watch over and over and over again. One of those movies for Shanda and I is a movie called I Am Legend with Will Smith in it. Now, I love Will Smith. This movie is pretty cool, but even for the time, the CGI was a little iffy. You know, it was a little off. It could have been better. The ending could have been better. Um, the first time you watch it's like, this is great. But after a couple of times, you're like, it might be just a little bit boring. Uh, I'm just saying, just saying. But the reason we, we re-watch it, the reason that we uh, um, like it is because it stands out in our mind. And the reason it stands out in our mind is that was the movie that Shanda and I watched on our first date. Um, we were supposed to go with a group of friends to watch the early showing of it at the Ava Family Theater down in Ava. And I went out and I had picked her up out at her, at, at, at her house and I brought her to town and all my friends had decided to go to the later showing and my friend Tony forgot to call me and tell me. And so we're there and it's like no one. And, and, and like I was a little freaked out because her, her mom was like, you know, you can go but it's got to be in a group. And I'm like, okay. And now the group is gone. What do we do? And we just went and watched the movie and as we're walking out, here comes our group walking in. They're like, what are you doing? We already saw it. But it was, a, it was awesome. It was a memory. And and we actually rewatched that movie for a couple of years after that on our on our dating anniversary just for fun because it stands out in our mind. Another movie that stands out in my mind is the Book of Eli. I love the Book of Eli. I love the action. I love Denzel Washington. I love the story. I love the the idea of that post apocalyptic world thing going on. I, it's just kind of cool to me. And of course, my favorite movie of all time because I'm a Batman guy is The Dark Knight. Heath Ledger's Joker is amazing. I'm just thinking, America. Yeah, amen, brother. Um, but you know, we we have those things that stand out to us for different reasons. Um, books that stand out to us for different reasons. I'm not a big uh, a big book reader, but I can remember different ones like the Red Fern Grows and the and the uh, Lemony Snicket series of unfortunate events that were books that, as I grew up, that I really enjoyed for some reason. And even though I wasn't a big book reader, I remember them. They stand out to me. Um, this story in the book of Esther is not a very long story, and I hope that you guys, those of you who have joined us in the last couple of weeks, have taken up my challenge to read through this book. It's only ten chapters. If, if this is your first time since we started the Esther series, that's all right. Um, you, we're going to talk about it, kind of get to the point we're in in the story here in a minute. But my hope is that you'll, you'll take a chance to read the story of Esther if you haven't, and uh, and really think about this story. It, it could be such a good action movie. I'm sure that there are some 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 um, creations of this story as movies out there somewhere. But to me, it's such a good story. It's got suspense. It's got action. It's got um, it's got a, um, a kind of a, a love story of nature. I don't know. Xerxes was obsessed with Esther. I'm not really sure what Esther thought of Xerxes. But you've got this 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 orphan. This you got an orphan girl who turns out to be the most beautiful person in the kingdom, taken in by a cousin, and it's like the ultimate rags to riches story. So my my hope is that as we've gone through this story. You've read this. You've read it like a story, like a book, like a movie. You've taken in those details. You'll remember those things that you would have remembered if it was a movie that you really enjoyed. Okay, because our favorite movies and our favorite TV shows and our favorite books, we can tell you what happened 
play by play by play by play, right? And this and this. Shanda, my, Shanda loves to read. And there's books that she can like, I don't have to read them because she can just tell me the whole story from start to finish because she loves them that much. We all have those. My, my prayer is that you've gotten something out of the, the story of Esther over the last couple of weeks as you've been reading it, as we've, as we've been discussing it, as we've sat right there in the middle at the, at the fourth chapter of Esther. Um, we're going to continue to move today. We're going to be looking at the story of Mordecai today a little bit. And we've talked about Mordecai some, and we're going to kind of go through his story a little bit more and, uh, and get an idea of where he's at. And then we're going to kind of focus in on how Mordecai's story ends in the book of Esther, okay? Because it's got an interesting ending considering how it started and, and what happens in the middle. So, we are in the book of Esther. Now, I'm, I'm going to be reading from, from the ESV today. Um, they, they will be up on the screen. If you enjoy following along and, and be able to read the same thing I'm reading, here at the bridge, we encourage that each individual find a version of the Bible that is strong and that, that speaks to them, that is simple and is something they can understand so that God can speak to them through that translation of the Bible. There's a lot of good, simple translations out there. Um, If you like to want to follow along, um, you can find these ESV Bibles in the back of your seat. Um, It it will also be up on the screen. If you don't have a copy of the Word of God, or you know someone who doesn't have a copy of the Word of God, or if you just start reading this and go, hey, this is a pretty simple um, version of the Bible, and I like it, and I would like to read it some more, take it with you. It's free. Completely free. Don't don't be embarrassed. Don't feel bad about it. Don't don't second guess it. I was the first one to grab one. As soon as that box opened, new book smell, baby. I was the first one to get one. Okay, and take it home with me. All right, um, and I and so feel free to grab one of those and take them with you um, and share them with someone if you know that they need them. We've got plenty. That's our free gift to you, anybody and everybody who might need it. Um, today we are going to be in the book of Esther. We're going to be in the book of Esther at the 10th chapter, but we're going to get there in just a little bit. I want to share with you Mordecai's story up to this point, and then we're going to break this down and talk about a specific thing that we want to learn from this story. I have one main point, one very specific point that I want us to take away from today, and we're going to look at that today. So back into our story. We've got this guy really quick. we got this guy named Xerxes. Xerxes is the king okay, of Persia, of Babylon, of 120... Seven provinces, seeing seeing four awake. 127 provinces. He loves himself so much. He's so prideful. He decides he's going to throw a party for himself. This party lasts six months. A a a, a full blown beer bash party lasts six months. At the end of that six months, he decides, well, we have to have an after party. Have an after party that lasts a week, seven days. On that seventh day, it says that he's high in spirits from wine, so he's drunk. And he decides, out of his drunken nature, that he's going to ask his wife, the queen, not Esther, the queen before her, to parade in naked, wearing nothing but her crown in front of his buddies. She refuses. He gets mad. His buddies, who also help make the decisions for, for laws in, in, in the kingdom, says, kick her out. Banish her. Get her out of here. So he does. Out of anger... He's drunk, he's angry, he kicks her out. He sobers up. After a little while, he, his anger calms. He starts to miss his queen, his wife. His buddies go, well, crud, if he's angry, then we're going to get in trouble. So we're going to come up with a plan to help him feel better. And he says, hey, king, why don't you go and we're going to find the most beautiful woman from every province in your kingdom. We're going to bring them in. We're going to spend a year making them even more beautiful. We're going to give them all these beauty treatments and stuff that they think will make, we think will make them more beautiful. And then we're going to parade them out in front of you and you're going to pick one. So they do just that. They go and they get 127 women. They bring them in. They live there for a year. Then they bring them out to meet, to meet Xerxes. And Xerxes looks at one named Esther and says, Esther is the most beautiful woman I've ever met. Sends all the other women home. They have good lives. They're taken care of, but they don't get to be the queen. Esther becomes the queen. It says Xerxes falls in love with, love with her instantly. She becomes the queen. Now, During this time period, leading up to Esther becoming the queen, we have this girl named Esther who's an orphan woman, an orphan girl. Both of her parents are dead. She gets taken in by her cousin. Her cousin's name is Mordecai. Mordecai takes her in and adopts her, becomes her dad, raises her okay, in his home, teaches her the ways of of their nation, the Jewish nation, so the chosen people of God, and, and, and gets her to this point. And then all of a sudden she ends up in the kingdom. 
Okay? Over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about this middle story where Esther is kind of comfortable. She's kind of in this good place where she doesn't have to worry. She's gone from rags to riches. She's got all the stuff in the world. She's got all of these friends, these, these women who take care of her. Well, along the way, her husband, her, her, excuse me, her now dad, her cousin Mordecai, becomes an officer of the kingdom. This other guy who's over her named Haman says, hey, I want all the officers to bow down to me. He refuses. Haman gets mad. He threatens to kill Mordecai and all, the entire Jewish nation in the 127 provinces of Xerxes. Mordecai is freaked out. He's mourning in front of the, in front of the kingdom, it says. And he gets this idea. He says, I'm going to call upon my, my daughter, my Esther, and I'm going to ask her to help. He, he says, Esther, we're in dire need. Your entire people, your entire race is going to be wiped off the face of, the, of, of this, the planet, of this kingdom. If you don't do something, you've got the ability to do something. Esther says, hey, you know what? I'm comfortable. I like where I'm at. I really don't want to do anything about it. Besides, I might die if I go before the king. So, so I'm not going to do anything about it. And Mordecai looks at her and says, listen, it doesn't matter how comfortable you are. It doesn't matter where you're at. Don't think that just because you're there in the kingdom that if they decide to kill all the Jews, they're not going to kill you too. They will. But maybe, remember this statement, maybe you have been put here for such a time as this. And we, we talked about that. Being put where God needs you to be. Even if we don't feel like we're supposed to be there. Even if we're comfortable. Getting, we've been talking over the last few weeks about creating a sense of urgency in our life. And getting out of complacency. Getting out of the high chair and being big boys and big girls. And, and stepping up into what God has. And having a faith that is worth dying for. Right? So that's Mordecai. Mordecai stayed bold, strong, and with a sense of urgency. They, hey, something's got to happen or I'm going to die, you're going to die, and we're all going to die. And someone's got to stop it, right? So this goes along and, and Esther goes before the king and he, gets, he was able to get um, the king and Haman into one room and they have this dinner together. And then this dinner, Esther plans to, to reveal who Haman really is and the fact that he... Um, is, 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 a, is trying to trick Xerxes into being okay in healing thousands of people. Okay? Now, you can imagine where Mordecai's at at this point. He's got to be more mortified. He's got to be terrified. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know what this outcome's going to be. What he does know is that there's this giant pole where his body will hang if, this, if Esther doesn't come through. And not only will he hang off that pole, but all of his people will watch his dead body as they're being killed. So, so he's in this stressful moment. Now along the way though, um, I, I want us to remember this, and then we're, we're going to take a break from, from Mordecai's story, and we're going to discuss something we can learn from his story, and then we'll come back in a little bit and catch the end. Along the way through this process, one night Xerxes can't sleep. And he gets up, and they didn't have TV back then. Okay, when I can't sleep, I sometimes I open up my Bible and read. Sometimes I open a book. Sometimes I play Candy Crush on my phone. Sometimes I turn on my TV. Okay, they didn't have those type of things. So he gets up and he calls one of his servants in, and he says, "Open up the history books of all the things that have happened to me and all the good stuff that's happened to me." He's such a prideful and selfish person. The, how he falls asleep is like, "Tell me a bedside side story. What did I do last week?" You know, are you serious? Are, are you serious? Tell me a bedtime story. I want to remember that time that I, you know, took over that kingdom. Why don't you tell me about it, guy? So he opens up, he cracks open this book, and his servant begins reads, reading to him. And all of a sudden, he comes across this name Mordecai. He says, Mordecai? He says, yeah, well, Mordecai saved your life once. I forgot about that. What is Mordecai, what is he doing now? And he says, well, Mordecai is one of your officers in your kingdom. And he gets excited and he gets happy. He says, did we ever thank Mordecai for saving my life? He says, no. And he says, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a parade. And he calls Haman in. He says, Haman, come here really quick. I'm excited about something. I've got to share it with you. And, and Haman comes in and he says, what's up? And he says, what would you do for a guy? He asks Haman, what would you do for a guy who saved your life? He says, well, if I was a king, I would parade that guy out and about and I would send my number one officer to thank him and, and, and to be the leader of a band that just paraded him through the streets and told everybody how great he was. And Xerxes said, hey, that's a good idea. There's this guy named Mordecai. And can you imagine at that point, Haman's like, oh, you know, I want to kill this man. And he says, I want you, Haman. And remember, Xerxes doesn't know this. I want you, Haman. I want you to lead that parade. And I want you to make sure everyone in my kingdom says thank you to Mordecai. And everyone celebrates Mordecai. Can you imagine that? Hey, can you think of a person in your life who doesn't like you, 
who has given you grief and has, 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 just, has just made your life miserable. And now imagine them leading a parade down 160 Highway as the Ozark County is cheering for you. I, I, maybe it's wrong, maybe it's a sin, but don't you just get a little bit of light, chuckle or, or joy from that, thinking about that? So that's what happens. H- Haman starts to, he's frustrated, so he has to do it. He puts on his smile. He says, hey, you know, hey everyone, look at Mordecai. Da, 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 da. They get through the parade. He goes home angry, and he complains to his, to his family. And they, they're the ones who gave him the idea to hang him from a 75-foot pole. And, and, and he's angry. So that's the point that we're at. Mordecai, he, he's like... Hey, the king loves me, but this guy hates me, and, and I don't know what to do. And he's stuck there in the middle between like a rock and a hard place. The king loves me. The guy who actually makes the decision and wants it has a, has a knife to my neck, but he's also going, Hey, Mordecai! And it's all a big, confusing mess, and he's stuck in the middle. Have you ever felt a little stuck in the middle of a situation? Where one side loves you, the other side hates you, and you're not sure what, it, what your name is at this point, right? That's where Mordecai's at. But Mordecai's about to learn a lesson. Mordecai, as we finish up his story here in a little bit, is about to learn a lesson about life. He's about to learn a lesson about loving God. He's about to learn a lesson about following God, about being one of God's people. Now remember, before Christ, God's people were the Jews and, and, and what they called God-fearing men, or men who weren't of the Jewish race, who were following the laws of the Jews to follow the true and living God. And so, he is one of God's people. And he's about to learn... Uh, one particular message that God then will teach us in the New Testament later, years after it happened, of what it means to be in love with God, of what it means to follow after Jesus Christ, of what it means to be sold out for God. He refused to bow down to man. He only bowed down to God. He refused to give up his people. He wanted to save them. He would have gladly gave his life alone. Because it wasn't just about him dying. It was about his people dying. He would have glad, gladly gave his life up to save God's people. He was sold out for God. And Mordecai is about to learn a lesson that we all can learn, that we all can get if we become completely, 100% sold out for God. Life's given over to Christ, letting Him lead us, following after His way, reading His Word, and doing what He wants to us, serving and loving and standing bold in the foundation of Christ. Okay? If you are a Christ follower, hear me out on this. If you're not a Christ follower or you're considering this, this is a good lesson for us to get because this is what your future can be, honestly, if you know Jesus Christ. Okay? Here's the lesson. Here's the one thing. I want us to get today the one point that if we are sold out 100% sold out to God that we can get what we can receive okay if you're following along in your worship guys you're, there's some fill in the blanks <clears throat> and this is the first set of fill ins it says this and we know that for those who love God all things work together for what good And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Let me tell you, those that are called according to His purpose, who they are. They're you. The Bible tells us that we all are predestined in the name of God for something great. He has a, this, this plan for our lives already. And He's just waiting. Jesus says, Behold, I, I knock. He, he wants us to answer. We are all called according to His purpose. We know that for those who not know God, those who say, I believe in Jesus, not those who say, well, yeah, I believe there is a God out there somewhere, not for those who show up for church or Sunday school or small group or youth group or, or, or serve or shake hands or make coffee. No, it says for those who love God, all things work together for good. That's a powerful statement. That is one of the most powerful statements in the Bible. Okay? The most powerful statement in the Bible is this. Jesus saves. Okay? That's paraphrasing, but Jesus saves. Okay? He died on the cross for our sins, and He can forgive you, and He can give you real life. But all things work together for the good of those who love God. See, here's the thing. We live in an, in an unfair world. We live in an ugly reality. A very ugly reality. Okay? 
And, and, and there's a lot of crud that happens to us along the way. There's a lot of times in our life where we are just at the worst of the worst. There's a lot of times where we're like, like Mordecai and we're stuck between a rock and a hard place and we don't know where to go. We don't have a way out. We're not sure what to do. We're not sure what direction to go in. Maybe we feel like everything has fallen apart around us. Maybe we're not sure what the outcome of the situation is going to be. We're not sure are the decisions that we make that we feel like we have to make. Will they hurt our family? Will they, will they hurt our reputation? Will they, will they upset our friends? What will happen if I do these things? And what I, we need to remember, whether you're a follower of Christ, going through life, trying to deal with these decisions, or, or you're considering God, or you're just figuring this thing out, and you've made big decisions in your life recently, all things work together for the good of those who love God. Does that mean that life is easy? No. Does that mean that we never have hurts and pains and frustrations and downtimes and sadness and depression and, and, and all that stuff? Absolutely not. That, that's unfortunately a part of humanity. and We're about to talk about that. But what it does mean that if we trust in God, if we, if we follow after Him no matter what it takes, if we, if we walk the path that He has created for our life no matter where it might take us, no matter who it might offend, no matter who might not understand, no matter the sacrifices and the things that we must give up, all things work together for the good, the outcome of those who love God. Here's the thing I want us to understand about this. God is more concerned with the ending than the beginning. Let me say that again. God is more concerned with the ending than the beginning. That means a few things. First off, God is not concerned about where you've been because if you ask Him, He will forgive you for the things that you've done. doesn't matter what they are. He will forgive you. He tells us that. I will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. Actually, east and west is that way. It is. Trust me. I see the sun, a sun, sunrise like five days a week when I go to work. He will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. So, He's not concerned with where you've been. He's not concerned with how you started. He says, I'm concerned with where you're going. He says, let's throw off the things that bind us and let's run the race that's set before us. That's what the Bible says. Not the race that, was, that already happened, but the race that's set before us. The, the, the path that's before us. He's concerned about where we're going. He's concerned about, about how He wants to get us there. We've talked about that a couple weeks ago when we talked about casting vision for our lives and men casting vision for our families alongside of our wives and, and seeing what God wants to do. Right? He's not concerned with where we're, we've been. He's concerned with, the for, with forward, with the future, with where we're going. So when God says all things work together for the good of those who love God. He doesn't say that I'm a qu he doesn't say, "Hey, here's a get rich quick scheme or here's a foolproof solution to all your problems and they will all go away tomorrow." No, he says this is a long road. This is this is a process that I will walk with you through. I will be there with you through. I will get you through it, but if you stick with me, if you love me, it will work out for your good. I know it doesn't look like it now. I know it's confusing. I know it's frustrating. I know it hurts. But if you stick with me, if you walk with me, if you follow me, it will turn out for your benefit in the end. Why? Because I'm your God. Because I love you. And because I have a plan for your life. A plan, plan the Bible says to prosper you, not to harm you. Right? All things work together for the good of those who love God. Let me, let me speak to those who know Christ really quick. If you are a Christ follower, that means you believe that this is the Word of God. And that means you believe it's the truth. And when we read a verse like that, and we hear that all things work together for the good of those who love God, and that's us, we should be a little bit excited about that, guys. That should be something that, 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 that excites us. That should be something that we can look at and say, you know what, things stink right now, but all things work together for the good of those who love God. You know what, I'm struggling right now financially, and I'm struggling with my marriage, and I'm struggling with my kids, and I'm trying to figure this thing out, and I'm reading the, my Bible, and I'm listening to God, and, I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm taking the necessary steps, and they're long, and they're hard, and they hurt. 
Spirit and they're frustrating, but all things work together for the good of those who love God. There's a little excitement. Right? I told you that we live in an ugly world. And an ugly world is full of ugly realities. But here's the beauty of the situation. For every ugly reality that we face in this world, God has created a beautiful truth. For every ugly reality that we face, for every, every trial and tribulation, for every person that we, we, we are two steps away from hating, I call it losing my Jesus because I just want to smack them. You know? I'm not, I'm not an old school Bible beaten, but man, some of these Bibles are thick and they'd hurt. Boom! You know? I got, here, I got one back here. This is my study Bible. This is a big dude. This thing weighs like four pounds. I could hurt somebody with this thing. Whack! Because you want to. Because you're frustrated, right? All things work out for the good of those who love God. For every ugly reality we have to face, there's a beautiful truth that God has to answer it. The first ugly reality that we're going to learn today, and these are ugly realities that Mordecai has learned. If you, if you listen to Mordecai, and he doesn't directly say these things, but when you watch a movie and you watch the progression of a character, you can see them learning lessons even when they don't verbally speak them, right? So he starts to learn these lessons, and I want us to learn them today too. The first thing is this. The, 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 there's the ugly reality that life is unfair. It's just unfair. It feels like some people get all the blessings. It feels like people who don't even know God are blessed so beyond belief that we just can't comprehend it, right? They've got everything. They've got it easy. They've got the good job. They've got the good education. They've got the good kids. They've got the big house and the big boat and the big TV. They've got it all, right? And we are stuck in our shack or we're stuck trying to make ends meet on minimum wage or struggling through or retiring with, not, with nowhere to go. I've seen people in my own family deal with that. And we're like, man, life just isn't fair. Or we, or we put all of our time and our effort and our energy and everything, our passion, into something that just crumbles around us. And we're like, man, life just isn't fair. Or we lose someone. Maybe someone we prayed for so hard we were blue in the face. And they still died. And we go, man, life isn't fair. Guys, life is unfair. Why? Because we live in a dying world. We live in a sinful world. We live in a world that is controlled by, and I'm not, it's true word, it's real, evil. Okay? Evil. There is an enemy, the Bible says, that wants to hurt you. And he will hurt you. And he will do everything he can to, to pound you and beat you until you are just bruised and battered and, not, and with nowhere to go and nothing left in the tank. Why? Because life is unfair. That's the ugly reality of life. It's unfair. <coughs> Excuse me. But the beautiful truth behind that is this. God is just. Now, here's the thing. When I say the justice of God, a just God, there is an aspect of that where God's anger, God's punishment comes through. It's true. I'm not going to deny it. It's in the Bible. It's there. But when I talk about the justice of God, it's beyond a wrathful God that we like to think of. It's beyond the mighty smiter that we think is going to hit us with a bolt of lightning. Being a just God means that He has grace, He has truth, and He has equality among all of humanity. See, King David was a man after God's own heart. But one sin still separated him from God, just like us. King David is the guy who killed Goliath. He was a man after God's own heart, one of the, the biggest heroes of the faith ever, ever, ever talked about. Trusted to be the first king chosen by God. Not the first king, but the first king chosen by God over his people. And yet one sin still separated him from God, just like us. Why? Because sin is sin. But asking forgiveness once still brought him back to God. Did he have to face consequences? Absolutely. But asking forgiveness once still brought him back to God, just like us. Why? Because we serve a just God. Listen to this. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 18, it says, Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to who? To you. He waits to be gracious to you. 
And therefore He exalts Himself to show mercy to who? To you. For the Lord is a God of justice. There's that word. Blessed are all those who wait for Him. Our God is a God of justice, a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of blessings. Here's, here's something I want us to think about in an unfair world. When we think about the people who, this guy survived cancer when my grandfather or my wife or my husband or my mom, my sister, whoever, died. Or this guy had it all handed to him while I've, I'm still drowning in my, in my school debt and I don't even have my degree yet. This guy has the job or the this woman has everything and I'm stuck with this. These two have a perfect marriage and we're struggling. These two have perfect kids and I'm a single mother. Whatever it may be, that unfairness, that unfairness of this world that you're thinking about right now, and we all got something in our head, I want you to remember this. It ends in this world. Let me say that again. That unfairness ends in this world. Why? Because those are things of this world. Not things of heaven. Because in heaven, relationships are completely restored. In heaven, God cares for us. In heaven, we're all on equal footing. Worshiping God together. Forgiven. White as snow. That's the truth. In the end, what is God worried about? The ending the unfairness goes away. Why? Because we serve a just God. See that guy who has the big house and the good job and the good bath bro? See, he doesn't get to take those things with him. He, they, they stay here. And if he chooses to love God and have Jesus as his Savior, someday you'll be on an equal cultural and social footing with him in the eyes of God. You already are. Unfairness dies with this world. Justice lives with God. That's the truth. The second ugly reality is this. Go ahead and bring up that second ugly reality for me. Everything does, listen to this, not happen for a reason. Everything does not happen for a reason. That is one of the most misquoted things ever. Okay, I'm sorry, but it's not in the Bible. You go through the Bible. You Google it. Okay? Google's got the Bible completely on there and all the resources. And if you can find that statement in the Bible or a statement that can be interpreted the same in a reasonable way, then I'll listen to you. But that statement there is not in the Bible. Everything does not happen for a reason. God, some people think that God has predestined everybody. And some people are predestined for success. Some people are predestined for failure. Some people are predestined for heaven. Some people are predestined for hell. That's a bunch of bull. Okay? Because my God tells me that all have sinned, but all can come to Christ. All can be forgiven. Okay? Everything does not happen for a reason. God is not the author of confusion, and He is not the author of evil. Okay? Those two things are in the Bible, by the way. He is not the author of confusion. He is not the author of evil. God does not wish bad on you. Some of us, we've read in the Bible where he was cursed. You know why that person was cursed? They were cursed because they gave God up, not because God gave up on them. Okay? God didn't curse them because he was angry with them and he didn't like them. They were cursed because God wasn't with them anymore. And living a life without God is a cursed life, guys. I'm just telling you. No matter what, the ending is bad. The ugly reality is that everything does not happen for a reason. Sometimes it just happens. Sometimes bad just happens. Sometimes someone else makes a choice that is out of God's control. Why? Because He promised every human being free will. And if that individual chooses to practice their free will, and their free will negatively affects you. My son has the free will to scream like that. That's all right. When their free will negatively affects you, that's not because God hates you or God let them do that or God wanted them to do that. It was because God had no control over that. Why? Because He's not going to break a promise to one human being. If they choose to misuse the gift God has given them, that's their fault, not His. Okay? That's that individual's fault. That person who hurt you or you, if you mischoose the gift of free will that God has given you, that's your fault, not His. God didn't get you fired. God didn't 
kill your marriage. God didn't kill your friend or your parent or your, or your loved one. Okay? God does not, is not out to get you. He is not chasing you around with a gun trying to shoot you in the back of the head. That's, some of us feel like that's what we're doing. Like, I can't follow after Jesus. I can't go down that road because I'm running the opposite way trying to run from God. Why? Because He hates me. God doesn't hate you. God says, I love you. And I have great plans for you. Plans to prosper you. Not to harm you. Not everything happens for a reason. See, that's a cop-out, guys. We like to say that because for two reasons. First off, if we say everything happens for a reason, then we don't have to come up with an explanation for bad stuff. Because we can't. Because we don't know why it happened. We don't know how it happened. And we don't know if God is even behind it or if, he, if He's removed from the situation. So we say, well, everything happens for a reason. And just hold on tight and you'll see the good in it. Oh, sometimes it's just bad. Sometimes bad things happen and bad things are just bad. They're not good. That's why it's called bad. Because bad is the opposite of good. You, you, you track it? You see what I'm saying? Bad is the opposite of good. So sometimes there's just bad stuff. Okay? But the beautiful truth behind it is God never makes mistakes. God never makes mistakes. Let me say it again. God never makes mistakes. You are not a mistake. doesn't matter who told you. You are not a mistake. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm just going to tell you. When we found out Caleb was born, was going to be born, when we found out we were pregnant, we ne- weren't necessarily trying to have a baby. But that doesn't make him a mistake. That's the biggest blessing I've ever received in my life since I married, married his mother. You are not a mistake. God's plan for you is not a mistake. Who you were created to be is not a mistake. Your personality your loves, your hates, the the things that you're attracted to are not mistakes. The things that you want to go be are not mistakes. The life you want to live, the the, the hobbies that you're attracted to because you want to to be a musician or you want to be this, that, it doesn't matter. They're not mistakes. Why? Because God created you to be that person. And He wants to take that and He wants to use it for something big. He wants to use your gifts and your abilities and and, and your loves for something huge, for to to change lives in the name of Jesus. He made you that way on purpose. Now, are we all human beings? Do we all have downfalls? Absolutely. Are our biggest strengths our strongest weaknesses sometimes? Yeah, mine are too. But God still created them to be used. And here's the thing too. In those moments of life where it's nothing but bad, where it's just nasty, ugly, Badness. There's no good involved. God says, hey, listen, I wasn't there. I did not do that to you. But guess what? I am a powerful enough God to get you out of it. I'm a powerful enough God to make something good out of it. This was not my plan. This was not the road I wanted you on. But guess what? I built an exit just up the, up the way. And I can get you off of that road and back onto the road that you're supposed to be on. And the exit might be long. It's not necessarily a shortcut. It might take a while to get there. It might be a little bit of a rough road. But hey, I created this exit. I can get you back to where you need to go if you trust me. Because I am the God of the impossible. I am the God who knows all. And I, I do not make mistakes. And if you follow me, guess what? All things work out for the good of those who love God. That's an awesome awesome truth. That's a beautiful truth. God never makes mistakes. The third ugly reality is this. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a, I have a Bible verse. I should probably share that with you, huh? Listen to this. As, as you're thinking about, about uh, everything does not happen for a reason, but God doesn't make mistakes. So in our struggles, in our hurts, when we're making hard decisions, when we're not sure what to do, God says this. In Proverbs 3, 5, He says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your what? Your path. He will get you back on the path He needs you on. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. No matter the struggle, no matter the hurt, trust that He didn't do it to you. He's not angry at you. But And also remember, that sometimes He might sucker punch you because that's the only way you'll look to the left when He needs you to. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. He will make straight your path. He will get you back to where He needs you to go. The third reality, ugly reality is this. We live 
in a very fake and dying world. Especially in our culture. We are full of fakeness. We are, we, we, we are taught from the day of accountability, which means the day where we can know the difference between right and wrong, we are taught to put on a mask by our culture. We are taught to hide our downfalls. We are taught to, we were taught to paint over them. We were taught to not let them out because they might embarrass us or they might embarrass our family or they might embarrass our town or our culture or our team. We are taught to, 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 to just hide it all the way and play nice. We are taught not to be angry. We are taught not to, do any, not to say anything about it unless it's culturally relevant. Then we should be angry because everybody else agrees with it, so we should too. We are taught to be fake. See, see it's almost like we... It's almost like we get to this certain point in life as we hit maturity and we, and we hit accountability and we go before the, the, the salesman and he says, here's your mask. You wear this one when you're out in public. You wear this one when you're with your family. You wear this one when you're with your wife or your, your husband. You wear this, this one when you're around your kids. You wear this one when you go to church. You wear this one when you go to work. You wear this one when you're at the gas station and in the grocery store. Some of them look alike, but all of them have their own unique details and they all are specifically designed for you so that you can put them on and no one ever has to see who you really are. You can remain embarrassed your entire life and no one ever has to know. You can hold on to that junk forever and no one will even know it's there. You, you, can, you can build that crud up in your heart and put on this mask and no one will even be able to see it's so big and beautiful and bright they won't even be looking at your heart because your face is so vibrant, right? We're going to give you every tool you need to be fake. We're going to teach you what it means to be beautiful. And if you don't live up to this, then you're not beautiful. We're going to teach you what it means to be a man. And if you don't live up to this, then you're not a man. We're going to teach you what it means to be good at life and to be successful. And if you don't live up to that, then you're not successful. We're going to teach you what it means to be a parent. And if you don't do exactly what we tell you to do, you better put on that mask and pretend like you are or you're not going to be considered a successful parent. We're going to teach you how to live your life. And if you can't figure it out, we're going to cover it up for you. Why? Because this is how it's got to be. Because it's fake. We all, we're, in our culture, we're going so many directions, none of us actually know where we stand. We never stop long enough to see what the foundation looks like. I've walked so far in this direction, I'm in sinking sand, and Christ is standing over there waiting for me. It's fake. No one agree with me? I'm tired of fakeness. I'm tired of fakeness. I don't like putting on a... I, I recently changed jobs because I was tired of having to put on a fake face every day. Same restaurant, different, pl different part of the restaurant. Because I was tired of having to smile and play nice. So I, because you know, my wife and I might have, be, might have gotten into an argument before work, but if I don't smile and play nice, I can't get that tip and I can't pay that bill and it's going to be another argument life, right? I was tired of it. Tired of fakeness. We live in a fake world. And we live in a world that's dying. A bi the Bible says that this world is literally groaning in pain. Waiting to die. Why? Because the Bible, the, the, the physical world has been promised new life just like us. And all of God's creation will be restored the way that God wants it to be done. In the end, the area God's concerned with. But right now it's dead. It's dying. And guess what? The people are dying without Christ. Guys, you're dying without Christ. You're dying when you spend your days putting on those masks. Because here's the thing, we put on this mask and it makes us look pretty and it makes us look vibrant and it, and it hides everything from us. But when we take that mask off at night, it's old and it's, and it's, and it's decapitated and it's fallen apart because we're dying. Because we put so much effort into hiding, into being fake, into, into getting ready to, to go out into the world and pretend to be someone that we're not, that we, we kill ourselves to do so. And we just become part of a dying world. We might still raise our hands for Jesus. We might still go to church. We might still know the Bible. We might still get up and preach. But when we're wearing those masks and we're giving all of our effort and all of our energy and we're literally killing ourselves over how other people think of us and over living up to cultural standards and living up to how someone else besides God says that I should live my life, then we are literally sucking the life out of ourselves and dying. But the beautiful truth is this. 
We serve a real and living God. Let me say it one more time. We serve a real and a living God. God. Jeremiah 10 at verse 1. I'm gonna, you, I would encourage you to read 1 through 10, but I'm gonna read 1 through 5 and then skip down to 8. It says, Hear the word of the Lord's, the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, learn not the ways of the nations, so don't learn the way of the world, <coughs> nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are what? Vanity. The customs of this world are vanity. They're, they're wasteful. They're, they're nothing. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by hands of a, a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. And they cannot... They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. Sound familiar? I know that we don't go out in the woods and cut down and carve an idol, but we might go to the store and charge it for an idol. Right? Or we might work overtime that we don't really need instead of going to our kids' game because we idolize our money. Or we might not pay our rent because we idolize that new toy or technology. Or, or, or we might not be good to our coworkers because we idolize ourselves. Right? He says, don't waste yourself with that kind of stuff. Why? Because it's fake. What does he say here? It's, it's a piece of wood. They, they carved it out, they decorated it up, but it's nothing. It, it can neither do good nor evil. It's got nothing. It is fake. It is dying. Why? Because it was a tree that they cut off at the life source and immediately it began to die. So it's fake and it's dying. Our idols are fake and dying. This world is fake and dying. Verse 8 says this, They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of idols is but wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphis or Uphis or whatever or Uphaz or whatever you want to call it. They are the work of the craftsmen and the and of the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work work of what of skilled men, not of God of men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation, his indignation, his anger. All that is fake. All that is dying. All of it isn't real. They, they can't do good nor evil because it's just a bunch of crud that's going to die in this world. But our God is real. He is alive and he is the king. I, I, man, that is awesome. Because in a dying world, in a fake world, we have this real God who can strip all the crud, all the mask, all the paint, all the stuff away to the reality of who we are. And here's what He's done for me. Here's what God did for me through my, through my, my Savior, through my friends, through me being able to, to look at Him, to, to fill the Holy Spirit which is God on earth, and to work through my issues and have a little bit of an encounter with my Jesus, you know what He did? He stripped all those masks away. And when He did, I was embarrassed and I was in shame, ashamed of all this sin and all this nastiness. But when I let Him do that, and He began peeling away the layers of sin and nasty, and He got to the middle and He said, Oh, hey, look at this big ball of hurt that you've covered up with all this junk. Let me take this hurt and let me throw it away. Guess what? You don't have to hurt anymore. And since you don't hurt anymore, you don't have to be embarrassed. And since you're not embarrassed, you don't have to wear a mask. And since you're not wearing a mask, you get to be the real person that I created you to be. And now I can live in your life and I can do something for you. That's what God did for me. I want Him to do that for you. That's the, that's the beautiful truth of a relationship with God. Really quick, I want to take just two seconds and I want us to look at Mordecai's ending. I want us to see that all things work together for the good of those who love God. And then I've got one more ugly reality and one more beautiful truth before we leave here worshiping God and celebrating. Um, by the way, <clears throat> really quick, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. Next week, we're having what's called Full Sabbath Sunday. And to those of you who volunteer that, you've, I've already talked to most of you, that means I don't want to see, see a single soul here, whether you're in worship or you're in tech or you're in cafe or kids or whatever, I don't want to see, see a single soul here until 10 o'clock. We're going to come in. Everything will be already taken care of. You won't have to serve in any way. We're going, to, we're going to worship together. We're going to fellowship. We're going to welcome people in. We're going to have a good time. We're going to rest 
which is what Sabbath means, is the rest. And we're going to worship and we're going to celebrate what God has done in our lives and what God has done through this church. That's next Sunday. You do not want to miss that. That's going to be awesome. You've got to be here next Sunday, okay? But Mordecai's story. Mordecai's ending. In Esther 10, it says this. King Ahasra, which is Xerxes, another name for him, imposed tax on the land and on the coastland of the sea, and all the acts of his power and might, and the full account of high honor of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him, and they, and they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia. For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers. For he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all of his people. Um, if you don't know this, Haman gets found out, and Haman ends up hanging from that 75-foot pole that he was going to hang um, he was going to hang Mordecai from. Not because, it, and this wasn't a case of what goes around come, comes around. This wasn't karma, okay? It was Xerxes getting mad that this guy was going to kill someone else and putting him to death. That's what it was. But he ends up hanging from that, that pole. And Mordecai goes down in the history books as the second in command and one of the best leaders in Babylon, okay? Now you tell me, does all things work together for the good of those who love God? Yes, do we believe it yet? All things work together for the good of those who love God. Now, some of you, maybe you still don't believe that because you say, hey, I thought that 10 years ago and look where I'm at today. still hasn't worked together for my good. What I tell you at the beginning, God is not worried with the beginning. He's worried with the end. Now, I want to take two seconds and I want to share one more ugly reality and beautiful truth with you. We're going to look at a spot in the book of Revelations. I'm going to tell you the same thing. I tell you every time we go to Revelations, don't be scared. Don't freak out. God's got a lot of cool stuff in there. It's not as crazy as a lot of us think. It's not as scary as a lot of us think. Today, it's really cool because it talks about good things happening for those who love God. Okay? The ugly reality is this. We may lose all of our battles. Some of us, we go through life feeling like a loser. <clears throat> we feel like we've lost every battle that we've ever fought. We know people who have hit curse after curse after curse around every corner after corner after corner. And we just think, man, where was their blessing? They followed Jesus until the end. They went to church every Sunday and they had squat when it ended. They didn't get a single blessing out of the stuff. Or you think about yourself and you're like, why should I follow him? All things work together for my good. I'm in my 50s or 60s or 40s or, and I have had nothing work together for my good. I'm in my 20s, my teens, and I have had nothing work together for my good. Why should I follow him? Listen to this. I told you, God's not worried about the beginning. He's worried about the end. Because the beautiful truth is that Christ has won the war. He has won the war over sin. He has the won the war against this world. Guys, He wants you to be on the winning side in the end. He wants to help you overcome. He wants to help you through adversity. He wants to be by your side to fight every battle that you have. Listen to this. In the book of Revelations, at chapter 19, at verse 11, listen, this is Jesus. This isn't the meek washing the, the disciples' feet carrying the lamb on his back, Jesus. This is the big, powerful warrior going to come and going to save the world and going to redeem his people, Jesus. And listen to this. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. I don't know about you, but my Jesus is faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many di diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Only God... Only Christ could have a name written that's so crazy that not a single human being could even interpret it because it was so powerful. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which is, he is called is the Word of God. Now, if you're still doubting that this is Jesus, the book of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was there in the beginning. It states later that that Word is our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we know this is Jesus. And the armies of heaven... That's the part I want you to, to focus in on. The armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, in, the, in pure clothes, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread in the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, 
the Almighty. On his robe and on his, on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Man, I get excited just thinking about that. And here's why I want us to be excited today. That statement there where it says, The armies of heaven ride along with him, clothed in linen with purity on a white horse. There's two different theological ideas behind that could be. And both of them are good for us. Some believe that it's the armies of heaven already, the angels the armies of God already established coming to fight with Christ to win over this world to save God's people. And we're on the sidelines getting to watch the battle knowing already that we won. The other, and this is the one I hope it is, this is the one I truly believe it is, the other, the other one is this, it's us. It's those who choose to follow after Christ. It's those who love God with all their heart who push forward no matter what, who know that you, doesn't mean you didn't make mistakes, but you're forgiven of your mistakes and you, and you lived your life for God. In the end, I choose to believe, this is what I think, that we're the ones who get to be there. And guess what? We get to be a part of the army. Either that or we get to watch the army of God defeat evil for good. Defeat the enemy who has caused your hurts, your pains, and your addictions. Defeat the enemy who has caused the problems in your finances and the problems in your marriage and the problems in your relationship with your kids and your, pa your parents and your family. Defeat the enemy who has who caused sin and cancer and negativity and health issues and all the death in the world. That enemy will be defeated by Christ in the end. And guess who gets to be there and gets to claim to be a part of the winning team? Those who love God. Now tell me, does all things work together for the good of those who love God? Absolutely. Because God is concerned with the end, not the beginning. Here's the thing today. We're going to worship one more time. And, and a lot of times we do a slow song and give you a chance to respond. We still want to give you a chance to respond. If you want to pray, come pray. If you want to come to the altar and pray, you can pray by yourself or, it, or we'll pray with you. That's up to you. But we'll be glad to pray with you. Okay? If you want to worship at your seat, worship at your seat. If you haven't given your life to Christ, well, I'm going to give you that chance in a minute. But here's why I wanted us to sing this particular song and why I wanted to sing it with excitement and upbeatness because this song is called God's Not Dead. And our God is not dead. Our God is the living God who overcomes this world, who will lead us into victory in our lives, who will lead us into victories over our hurts and our addictions and our pains, who will lead us into victory at the end, who we will be able to spend an eternity alongside not one about the crud in this world, the fakeness and the nastiness and the dying and the unfairness anymore. That is a God who is alive and a God who loves you. And we're going to celebrate that. And we're going to worship Him. Let's pray. Heavenly.